Well, the SpaceX team sure is excited this week. I wonder why that may be. Yes, the atmosphere at Starbase in Texas has a certain feeling of anticipation in the air as the countdown to the flight of this monster rocket got closer. But that is only the tip of the iceberg because this week has been pretty interesting. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. This video is supported by Brilliant. Hey hey, Marcus Hauswithy here and let's kick off the action at the launch site with this big water tank which is the final tank to be added to the deluge system as far as we know. As I talked about last week, SpaceX was preparing to have this finally connected. Although it had sat here for quite some time on the foundation, this was the week to get it fully hooked up. It was lifted up by the LR11000 crane and placed on the holding pedestal. This allows the tank to sit in line with the other two big tanks and line up with the new manifold inlet below. In fact, the new manifold needed to be hooked up to the other two large tanks anyway, given that the old one was completely removed the week prior. When the time comes, the extra tank will add more capacity to the system. The water will flow through the pipes to the water-cooled steel plate, which will burst forth underneath the orbital launch mount. Speaking of which, it is spruced up and ready to go with Elon sharing this incredible news at the start of the week. Yes, SpaceX have indeed completed and documented 57 items required by the FAA for Flight 2. Six of those items, which bring it up to the total of 63, actually refer to items that need to be addressed for later flights. So from that point, SpaceX were good to continue the process, stating that they are real close to the next Starship launch and working closely with the regulators. It turns out that any confusion last week with the FAA process was largely all down to the odd wording, even seeming to confuse Elon there as well. Now, zooming in on this list, what you will notice immediately is that the language is kind of odd. Replace certain bolts and increase torque for certain flanges. Doesn't seem real specific, does it? Well, my friends, this is obviously a heavily processed and redacted set of details to post publicly. What we can see, though, is the stuff that we've witnessed SpaceX working on the past four months, and all of it is completed. Now, just to help demonstrate some of this, a huge thank you to Arne for sending me this awesome upgrade to the terrific 3D model here on the set. Just look at the detail of this amazing orbital launch mount component. You can even pop out all of the hold down clamps to sit the Starship right on top. How cool is that? Anyway, the big upgrade is all around the pad design, and we've talked about this almost every week since the first flight. We now have the water-cooled pad deck and the improved deluge system. Upgrades to the fire suppression that blasts out underneath that main table here. In fact, as you may know, there have been loads of issues that they've been addressing around the booster leak mitigation just to limit the fires breaking out or explosions happening during the flight. It is critical to purge and protect the launch table and the R end of the booster itself. That is, of course, where most of the action is happening. There is loads and loads of focus here addressing issues with Raptor engine reliability, such as sealing off potential leaks and adding a bunch of sensor equipment to the aft end. There are new improvements to help with the flight termination system, and obviously the hot staging ring has been added as well with this new method of stage separation for the Starship. Wouldn't you know it, Arn also shot this ring addition over to me as well to add in in on that goes there. Look, I'm not going to go through everything individually here, but a link to this is in the description if you want more information and to dive right into it. Thanks again, Arne, for shooting me this neat model and upgrading it for me. If you want to check out what they are doing to create these masterpieces, morethan3d.com, link also in the description. Now, a little later in the week, the work platform returned back under the launch mount with Ship 25's transport stand being moved below the tower arms. Yes, it was time for the beast to come back down. It was raised up in what is becoming a more routine process now, pivoted over to the side and then down to the stand. As SpaceX's Kathy Leaders said in an event in South Padre Island, this destacking was to prepare for final flight preparations and checkouts as well as installation of the flight termination system. So moving on to the tank farm, these pipe manifolds were being lifted into place for the two new methane subcoolers that recently arrived. These units, also lovingly referred to as hippos purely because of the shape of them, work by having cryogenic liquid oxygen or methane running through pipes in the middle as shown in these renders by O here, BL3D Eccentric. In the tank itself, the much colder liquid nitrogen super chills the propellant flowing through, making the liquid nitrogen raise its temperature above its 
boiling point a toasty negative 195 degrees C or negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit. And all that boiling nitrogen is exactly what we see spewing out of the top of there like in this shot. Now if we jump over to the oxygen side of the tank farm, a new turbine pump was installed too. This is another critical part in that same process to support faster propellant loading. You can see here how the liquid oxygen enters the turbine at the bottom and is then pulled upward at tremendous pressure. All of these new additions to the tank farm will be very helpful for future flights. Although it is exciting seeing SpaceX working on all these new sub chillers, these haven't actually been hooked up yet, so I'm assuming that they won't be used during flight two. That isn't a problem by the way, having all the extra units will just allow propellant load to happen faster than it can now and save a little boil off propellant overall, so there's really no urgency in getting these up and running. Now just as we were preparing the video to go live last week, Ship 20 was receiving some rare attention. Yeah, Ship 20, the original one that was actually fully stacked halfway through 2021. These sure were some iconic pictures, weren't they? Well, here it was having its lifting points covered over by heat shield tiles, which is a pretty odd thing to see, isn't it? I wonder why SpaceX has decided to do this now. Perhaps they intend to keep this around as a long-term resident of the rocket garden, or perhaps it's being spruced up before being relocated somewhere else. Either way, if they intend to scrap the ship, this operation would make no sense. Stacking operations of the prototypes continue. Here was the Ship 31 stack being integrated with its forward dome section that we saw move to the high bay last week. You can see it here being picked up and then lifted upwards to be moved over the turntable to allow an automatic welder to begin fusing the two. A couple of days after this, Ship 31's common dome section moved out to the high bay with the stacking operations following quickly. Booster 13 continued its stacking too. A four ring aft section was added to the existing eight ring stack, so roughly one third of the way there to its full height. We also had a brand new booster thrust simulation stand moved into the ring yard this week. This was previously being stored at the Massey site as it underwent the construction, but this week it moved into Mega Bay 1. Booster 10 was soon lifted onto it, so there couldn't have been any Raptor engines installed like many thought that there might have been. Later that evening, there it rolled out of the Mega Bay and all the way over to the Massey site for the thrust simulation testing to begin. Just look how beefed up this new stand is. Only about a day after arriving, it began loading ahead of its test. Just take a look at this though. They look to have only loaded the methane tank with propellant here, so perhaps this is simply to structurally test out the new smoother dome design. One that is a first being introduced on Booster 10. The test continued into the night and it detanked around nine hours after beginning loading. SpaceX also out of the blue posted two unique videos from their engine testing facility in McGregor showing Raptor firings in different scenarios. This one was a vacuum engine firing after being intensely cooled down to imitate the super cold environment after coasting in space. That was then followed by this one which is a sea level raptor firing to simulate the descent onto the lunar surface, something that requires large throttle variations given the much lower gravity, all of which is mentioned in this NASA document linked below. So yes, in the final countdown as approvals are provided, we are eagerly awaiting some further launch information. The most recent information that we have is from FAA Administrator Polly Trottenberg, who told reporters that the FAA are working well with SpaceX and have been in good discussions. The teams are working together and are optimistic that approval could be sometime next month. The excitement from the fans and the SpaceX team is real clear. In fact, early in the week, the mass arrival of all of the employees at the launch site was a great sign of the events to come. Soon after this new image appeared, the perfect photo op suitably captioned made on Earth by humans. I really love that slogan. It really just highlights how little our planet is in comparison to what is out there to explore. And I tell you, I just love packing it all up into these videos to bring it to you every week here with the team. Thanks for being here, helping us out. Just look how close we are to that half million subscriber mark now. Only 12,000 to go and we are there. You are awesome.
Before moving on, shout out to Stoke Space entering the award for the most steampunk looking rocket display of all time. This thing looks like it belongs in Mad Max or something, don't you think? So what are we actually looking at? Well, it's a static fire to simulate a hop mission, which checked out all systems possible in the lead up to a real hop test. In fact, if I'm understanding it correctly, they send false information data to the vehicle, which then gave them the chance to test out simulated roll issues, which is why we see the reaction control system there at the top fighting hard to correct it. All apparently a huge success across the board, so well done. Can't wait to see that real hop test. We also had a surprise launch by the Firefly team too. As a test for the Space Force, they had been put into what is called a hot standby phase. This means that at some point, they would randomly receive a notice to launch with some finalized orbit requirements. In this mission named Victus Knox, Firefly completed all final launch preparations, including trajectory software updates, payload in encapsulation, then transporting it to the launch pad, it then had to be mated to Alpha, and then fueled all within the 24 hour period. At that point, Alpha then launched at the first available window just 27 hours after the receipt of those launch orders. That is pretty crazy. Sadly, there was no live stream of the event, but it got to orbit successfully and deployed the secretive satellite at the target destination. That is an incredible success for Firefly. We finally got to see ULA's Atlas V lift off this week as they launched a new mission for the National Reconnaissance Office, this one called Silent Barker. Now this all followed several delays, including a complete rollback to the vertical integration facility due to that recent hurricane threat. Greg Scott here was on site prior to all that going down, grabbing these shots. I've got to say, I really love the mission patch for this NROL 107 mission. In this flight, the NRO chose the maxed out 551 configuration of the Atlas V, and here is some neat footage of it rolling out with the large 5.4 meter fairing and all five solid rocket boosters. This configuration makes sense, of course, considering that they wanted these satellites to be placed into an orbit around 7,000 kilometers above a typical geosynchronous orbit. Just a day before liftoff, a meticulous wet dress rehearsal was performed by ULA to ensure that all systems were good to go. It's worth mentioning, I think, that this step is reserved for high priority missions, just like this bunch of very expensive military satellites, whatever they may be. Now, coming to the launch here, first, the RD-180 engines ignited along with its five solid rocket boosters, and look at these amazing views of the launch. I've got to say, I've missed seeing the Atlas V in action, and check out the exhaust plume roaring out of the flame trench there. I can't believe I'm saying this, but this is the very first launch of Atlas V this year. The last was back in November of 2022, and that is, by the way, the longest gap between Atlas V missions in 20 years. I'm sure that Falcon 9 has got a lot to do with that. The first stage here propelled the rocket, hitting supersonic speeds within just 35 seconds, and it reached max Q about 11 seconds after that. The SRBs had done their job, so off they pop, and due to the secretive nature of this mission, the stream didn't really cover anything else apart from the release of the payload fairing. The satellites between the fairings were the first batch for a new tracking and observation constellation that is going to keep an eye on what is happening within geosynchronous orbits, some kind of watchdog type constellation. At this higher altitude above those networks, it's way easier to observe all those other satellites known or unknown. Now, we won't actually see any more NRO missions with Atlas V at all. This was the 18th mission for them, and the final one due to ULA transitioning to its new Vulcan rocket for future NRO missions. Additional silent Barker satellites will fly on that vehicle, with the full constellation becoming operational by around 2026. We had more Starlink action this week, streamed only on X. Early in the week on Monday, here was Falcon 9 Booster 1071 preparing to take off from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. And yep, that is pretty typical of a Vandy launch. It is in there somewhere. Cue all those daft commenters out there telling me all the time that rocket launches are CGI. Why would you CGI this? In this mission, a batch of 21 Starlink satellites were on their way to orbit, and beautiful still shots shared later too. I I love this one here of the exhaust plume. This was the 11th flight and landing for this booster on the of course I still love you drone ship. We then had a second flight just hours before uploading this video with another 22 Starlinks on board from across the country in Florida at Slick 40. Only the fifth flight for this first stage booster and back down this time on just read the instructions.
The Expedition 70 crew took off to the International Space Station just yesterday on the MS-24 mission. NASA astronaut and flight engineer Laurel O'Hara on her first mission joined cosmonauts Commander Oleg Kononenko, a space veteran with five missions to his name, along with flight engineer Nikolai Chubb on his debut space mission as well. The always reliable Soyuz kicked the mission off right on schedule. The Korolev cross there, always a fun shot to see. And before we knew it, they were in orbit on the way to the International Space Station. Literally within a few hours, they were docking at the space station's Earth-facing port on just their second orbit around the Earth. It's crazy how fast they can get Soyuz to the station. They were, of course, welcomed on board by everybody there. And it is a busy station once again, isn't it? While on the topic of the ISS crew, the Axiom 3 team has been announced midweek, which is scheduled to fly to the ISS no earlier than January next year. This one marketed as the first ever all-European commercial astronaut mission to the ISS. They will of course be flying on Crew Dragon. I think it's going to be interesting to see how close the new crew tower at Slick 40 will be by then. Greg Scott took to the skies at the Cape, and here you can see the construction is underway already. The other three tower sections still being worked on here at SpaceX's Cape site close to the huge Star Factory. Thanks for helping Greg do what he does there on Patreon. It is great to have these insights, and there is a lot more where those came from in his library. Now we have another enthralling discovery made by the James Webb Space Telescope, this time unveiling the secrets of the exoplanet named K2-18b, a giant planet just a little smaller than Neptune, orbiting the cool dwarf star around its habitable zone. Now, this planet is around 124 light years away, and it has been intriguing to scientists since its discovery in 2015 by the Kepler Space Telescope. It has a thin hydrogen atmosphere that receives about the same amount of light that we receive here from the Sun. When Hubble then observed this peculiar planet a few years ago, it also discovered signs of water vapour in the atmosphere. This discovery made it stand out even further because all planets discovered that were in and around habitable zones of their parent stars, this was the only planet that had the water vapour found, a heavy possibility that this could have an ocean. If it does, then it's a great candidate to sustain life. So this of course made K2-18b a prime observation candidate for the James Webb Space telescope? Well, it has found a lot of really intriguing and exciting data. First, it shows signs of an abundance of carbon molecules. It found carbon dioxide, large amounts of methane, and hints of a molecule called dimethyl sulfide, which on Earth is released from oceans by marine bacteria, algae, and other marine organisms. Now, that, my friends, is some pretty great clues for life. Keyword there, clues. Nothing conclusive yet, but there are definitely some many unknown factors. Some astronomers are speculating that the conditions could be too hot to allow life to exist as we know it, or even to let the ocean stay a liquid. So yes, the data still needs more validation according to the researchers involved. Hopefully, future observations are going to help answer some of those questions. Something that always amazes me is just how wonderfully these telescopes work. In this case, observing K2-18b with the help of very small amounts of starlight that pass through the planet's atmosphere during a transit. Essentially, when the planet is right in between the telescope and its parent star, K2-18. It's just like a cosmic game of peekaboo, really. Everything that it has discovered here just came from observing the two recent transits of the planet. And there are many more observations already planned. Just picture the mad programming and the tech skills that it takes to pull off all this cool stuff. Well, if you want to get ahead in a STEM career, you've got to keep honing those skills and enjoy loving the process of learning. Luckily, there's a fun and easy way to learn with Brilliant.org, a hands-on, user-friendly platform for people who want to boost their smarts in these important areas. I've personally had a career in programming for a few decades before I even started this amazing YouTube stuff, and although I don't do it quite so much these days, I can tell you that at the time, I was constantly learning new and better ways to increase those skills. I've seen firsthand how in-demand solid computer science, math, and data skills are, and that's where Brilliant's wonderful interactive lessons come into play. They've got these bite-sized components that make complex stuff easy to grasp, and Brilliant makes it a cakewalk to build a daily learning habit so your personal and professional growth is always within reach. The range of content is so vast that there is something here to interest anyone at pretty much any level. I was recently checking out one collaborative course that they did with the beautiful Kurtzkazar channel, which I absolutely love. The illustration, 
pairing very well with this style of learning. In this example, they dive right into supernova energy calculations or what could be involved in terraforming Mars. Seriously fun stuff. If you want to give Brilliant a shot, you can do it for free for a whole month. Just head over to brilliant.org slash marcushouse or click the link in the description below. The first 200 to do that will snag a sweet 20% discount on Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thank you, Brilliant. Now, I've got to say, I didn't cover this last week, not because I didn't want to, but because, well, frankly, there wasn't really any good video of the event. Yes, back on September the 8th, another Virgin Galactic mission took off with three customers on a trip to the edge of space. There was no live stream of the mission, and actually the crew of the mission were only announced after VSS Unity had already landed. We did, however, have this recap video of the event published since then, which is at least something. So yes, we did get some really cool views of the mission in play, and the passengers here relishing their zero-G experience for a few minutes before Unity fell back into the atmosphere to glide back to land at Spaceport America, successfully finishing their third commercial flight. So I hope you enjoyed this video, my friends. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe so we can get to keep making them. Also, loads of you really loving the new flight patch design by Tony Bella. What do you think of this on the darker color here compared to the light one? It works quite nice on a bunch of colors, actually. Remember, we are only selling this one for a few weeks. Profits are split right down the middle to help Tony Bella do what he does with these amazing infographics, as well as helping to produce our work here. You probably don't realize that there are loads more product options than clothing, too. There's mugs and things, bottles, stickers, bags, everybody is really excited for this upcoming launch. If you would like to just help more directly like all these amazing patrons, YouTube members, and ex-subscribers here on the right, all this support makes a colossal difference to us. It really does. If you want to continue with more space goodness, the algorithm thinks that you will enjoy this video here next, or maybe these videos. Thanks for watching all this way through, and I'll see you all in the next video.